Hello and welcome to the MotorOne.com and today Inside EV's uh, Test Car Happy Hour. Uh, I'm Seth Mears, my editor in chief of MotorOne and Inside EVs, and joining me today we have MotorOne senior editor Brett T. Evans and special guest MotorOne alum uh, Stephen Ewing, joining us from from sunny so Southern California, I assume. Mm -hmm. um, and here to talk to us about one of the one of the most exciting and one of the most controversial uh, electric vehicles that we have we have driven and reviewed in quite a long time. Uh, before we get to that and start talking about the cars, let me just say wherever you guys are watching this, we kind of simulcast this to our YouTube channels, to our social media handles. Wherever you are, please feel free to ask a question, write a comment in the chat. We will get it. Uh, if we like it, we'll put it up on screen. We'll do our very best to answer it. Um, and yeah, we, we love audience participation. I expect quite a lot of it this time. I'll also just answer because this is pertinent because we have been doing these uh, between both this this podcast started on Motor One, and then we've started to extend it over to Inside EVs as we've been talking more and more about electric cars. So, um, Mr. DSN or MRDSN one eight nine to answer your question: um, How does Motor One and Inside EVs relate? We are essentially sister sites, like they're owned by the same company. Um, I'm part of the management team, the editorial team for both of them. Um, so we work really closely hand in hand, the two editorial teams do, to uh, get comprehensive 360 degree coverage of everything automotive, basically. Um, cool. So let's let's hop right in. Steve, you drove the new VinFast VF8. This, I did, yes. This is a car that we had... Um, a really early preview drive of last year, um, our own uh, Dominic Yoni went out to Vietnam to drive a super early prototype of this car, came back with, you know, what I would call sort of a mixed review. It's really hard in that prototype stage to be too critical or too positive because you just don't really understand like what the vehicle is going to be. At that time, it was, you know, it felt like it was going to be a really early stage. And lo and behold, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, VinFast said, hey, we're ready for business in the U.S. with the VF8. So they invited the full complement of automotive media to come out and do a test drive of the car that is on sale now or yep, about it's to on sale. On sale now. OK, um, so why don't we start by talking about what the VF8 is, right? Like what's the. Yeah, so, so it's it's effectively your, you know, if you're going to launch a new electric car in the U.S. right now, the, you know, compact to midsize two row small premium crossover, that's kind of the way to do it. So we're talking about something that competes with, you know, anything from the Ionic 5 and the Kia EV6 to the Volkswagen ID4. Um the VF8 is a little bit larger than all those, and uh, it's got a ton of room inside, actually. But it's just that kind of, you know, straddling the line between compact and midsize, small crossover. Uh, it's only available with a dual motor, all-wheel drive configuration right now. Um, in fact, the only one that's available at the moment is called the City Edition, uh, and that's the first one that uh, is being rolled out. And customers are taking delivery of it right now. Like, I've already seen a few. Uh, on the road. VinFast was saying that they have, I think, 14 locations in California already wow. and that they're going to open 14 more by the end of the year. Um, but they're only in California and in Canada for the time being in North America. Yeah. And just to hit it really quickly, um, uh, Lynn, sorry, uh, Lynn RD or Linny RD said, I understand that VinFast is a company that has been making cars for a while, including ICE cars. So Correct. That that's true. They were making they're making gasoline powered cars, honestly, not for very long. This is like mm -hmm. two or three years ago they started building uh, um, ICE cars essentially, and then have I think already announced that they're not going to build any more gas or gas powered cars and are, are moving completely into electric. They've they've moved in really quickly, like o overall, well, like the even this car is only like less than two years in development, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. right? Well, and a lot of their earlier products were licensed versions of existing cars. So, you know, like some of their earlier gas cars were based on the previous generation 5 series, previous generation X, X5. So this is kind of one of their first ground up home engineering products. Yeah. And they're, you know, VinFast as a company is, is part of this larger conglomerate called Vin Group, which employs like 50,000 people in Vietnam. And they they do like shopping malls and luxury resorts and buses and bikes and all, they do everything. It's a huge, huge, huge corporation. But VinFast itself as a car maker only launched in 2017. So we're not talking about a very 
old company. And yeah, like Brett said, they were using kind of partnership vehicles before. This one, um, you know, VinFast is really proud of the fact that they were able to do a complete ground up platform electric car, everything, you know, in such a short amount of time. Um, and in fact, the the design, a lot of people comment on the design saying it looks very European. Mm -hmm. and that's because it was designed by Pin and Farina. So, mm -hmm. you know, you've got a really strong name behind the design. And I, I mean, I know it's sort of controversial, but I think it looks really cool. Um, and the paint on the ones that we drove was like super rich and deep and like, I think the whole thing looks really neat, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not in love with yeah. the design either, but I would say that like from a, I think most people just walking in off the street would look at this and say at the very least, like, cool. Right. Like no, no big yeah. issues. Not, they're not yeah. going to, you're not going to put a poster of it on your wall, but you're also not going to like turn around in the dealership because of the way that it looks right. Like yeah. very middle of the road, sort of aiming for that European premium look, I would say in this. this Completely. Thing. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, the fact that it was, you know, designed and built and engineered and everything so quickly, it means it, it just doesn't quite feel done. Um, yeah. I talked to some people who drove the prototypes in Vietnam and then drove these new prototypes. And they all said that it doesn't really feel like anything changed. Um, and to me, you know, I, I've driven lots of early prototypes, camouflage prototypes that have felt more complete than the VinFast did. Just in terms of, I mean, a lot of different things, software, overall fit and finish, quality, um, ride and handling, just kind of everything wasn't really where it should be. Yeah, so, and and we've got already a, a callback, Steve, to your review and the, the headline, which was, uh, you know, a VinFast VF8 um, first drive, colon, yikes, yep. right? Um, <laughs> Not so let's I absolutely want to get into that. I want to get into sort of um, what what's not right now, like what seems like it's improvable. But let's talk a little bit because, again, this is a brand new thing. So I just have the review up right now and I'm looking like you said, it's it's a single spec right now. They're mm -hmm. going to do different versions of it. But the hard points are it's an 82 kilowatt hour. I'm not sure if that's if that's nominal or if that's um, uh, usable uh, battery pack. I don't think that we we probably know at this point. Um, mm -hmm. And, and the one thing that stands out for, from an EV perspective right away is that's a that's a pretty good size battery pack these days. You know, that's mm -hmm. a little shy of the Mach-E GT that I was just in, for instance, at I think 91. Um, but 191 miles of range out of that is an incredibly bad uh, sort of power density figure, I would say. <laughs> yeah. And that's for the that's for the plus model that has more content in the 20 inch wheels. If you get the base version, it's still not great. It's 207. Um, but yep. we spoke to VinFast about it during the launch. And the good news is the next version of this car that comes out, it's going to be called the standard edition, not the city edition. And basically it's the same battery size, but they've made some changes to like the internal chemistry of the battery where it's just more energy dense and therefore more efficient. So the standard edition is going to be effectively the same vehicle, but it's going to have 243 miles of range in the plus spec and then 264 for the base eco one. So numbers that are a fair bit more competitive for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And then in terms of like, just again, I'm looking at specs and I've, I've, I read your review in terms of just powertrain alone, right? Power delivery and things like that. Yeah. Reason, pretty reasonable, right? Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. 402 horsepower, it's yeah. relatively quick. Uh, mid range power is good. You know, there are no weird surges in it. It, it, it drives, nicely if you're talking about the powertrain exclusively um sure. yeah that was that was one of the areas where i really didn't have any issue and it sounds like you know the range is going to get fixed soon it accepts fast charging it up to 160 kilowatts so good not great but still yeah. you can plug into a 150 dc fast charger and you know make use of it so in terms of the battery and the the electric motors and everything i don't really see any issue there um the, the larger issues, I think, that are going to be difficult to update are things like the, the chassis. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the ride quality is really bad. It's bouncy, it's, but at the same time, it's floaty, and it's, like, weirdly stiff at times, and then it's, like, really kind of uncontrollable at times. It, um, I talk about this in the story, but it actually made me carsick, yeah. uh, which has never happened to me before <laughs> in my entire life. Yeah. Um, to the point where I was like, did I eat something? Like what's, what's wrong? I like, honestly had no idea what that felt like before. 
Uh, yeah, and we, we can get to it. Like some of the places that I expected there to be a lot of criticism and deserve would be uh, if I was just guessing and I'd never seen the car, I knew how quickly they brought it to market. Interior fit and finish, like, uh, you know, uh, um, evident quality based on what you can see and touch and feel and, and hear when you drive and things like that. That's really, really difficult to get right for brand new uh, automakers. And it's, mm -hmm. it seems like it's especially difficult to get right for new automakers that are moving just at the speed of light with this stuff, right? Yeah. I did not expect there to be this kind of like um, uh, problem with just the basic way it goes down the road in a straight line, let alone a mm -hmm. curve. And, and Steve, just to be clear, like, I'm not just, I read a lot of coverage of this car, right? Like I didn't read a lot of positive coverage of the car and I read a, read a lot that echoed some of those same sentiments. Like they just don't have mm -hmm. uh, steering suspension, as you said, chassis, like like body motion and stuff like that. They have not tuned that in a way that's that's no. appropriate for a new car in 2023. Yeah. No, and again, I'm not judging this on, you know, wanting it to be a performance car or a sports car or anything. I'm talking just about daily drivability and- there's it just does these weird things where the steering almost feels kind of like a variable ratio in the reverse sense where it's like super vague when you turn into a corner but then mid corner all of a sudden you get like a ton more feel to it and it it makes it really hard to have kind of like a stable cornering process uh there's absolutely zero feedback in the wheel at all it really it just feels very disconnected and it feels very hard to control because of that inconsistent uh right. steering response so it, it's little things like that the, the good news is some of these things can be fixed um vinfast is really happy about the fact that you know the car is capable of over-the-air updates so mm -hmm. anything electronic can and you know hopefully should be updated but Big fundamental hard points like the suspension design is just, it, it really needs a rethinking. Um, and, you know, we asked some of the VinFast executives, you know, hey, hey, out of curiosity, what other cars did you benchmark in the process? You know, did you drive an Ionic 5? Did you drive a Mach-E? Um, and they were like, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, Radical honesty. Um yeah, so there are a bunch of comments in here that are relating to pr to price. I'm not going to get all of them, but we've got mm -hmm. um, you know coming out with a vehicle like this, it should have been between twenty five and twenty nine thousand dollars. He said twenty five dollars and twenty nine thousand. I think he probably meant twenty five thousand, <laughs> or maybe he's being very harsh. Um, so that's th that's another issue too, right? Again, challenger brand, young company mm -hmm. coming into what is arguably the most difficult market in the world mm -hmm. to um, to be successful in in under those conditions. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, sort of dipping a toe in the water, uh, if you can say that about just California, but it's a giant mm -hmm. part of the, obviously the U S market, uh, it doesn't, it feels like they pro they should have been seeking a strong price advantage considering everything else that was happening. Even if, even if the, the issues that you're talking about were, were sort of perfect. Right. And, and had been. Solved. Yeah. And so, I mean, what it comes down to is the. <laughs> it, it starts at 49 grand um okay. the yeah. ones that we tested uh the the, the plus spec are uh 57 grand um which is just it's a lot when you consider the quality issues mm -hmm. but when you actually look at the list of features just on paper i mean it, it's very well equipped for a car of that price it's got you know heated and cooled seats it's got all sorts of uh level two driver assistance features it's got leather, um, you know, a full in infotainment suite, uh, wireless CarPlay and Android Auto. It's got all the things that you would expect in a car that costs fifty-seven thousand dollars. Unfortunately, it's just not put together to a point where it feels worth the price. Is there anything that redeems it in terms of like, is it does it qualify for any special incentives or um, or you know, is there any kind of like fringe benefit to the car that isn't reflected it's in either the price, the features, the driving experience? It's got a really solid warranty. I will I will say that. Um, you know, VinFast is really proud of. They have 24-7, 365 mobile uh, support, mobile customer service. Um, I think the, the, the warranty, it actually is better than like the Hyundai Kia, you know, 10 years, 100,000 miles. It's like 125,000 miles, uh, you know, bumper to bumper warranty. So, you know, they're aware that there's going to be some issues with especially, you know, the, the first rounds of cars and everything, but it's all covered. And so they'll help you out. They'll 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 get it fixed. But 
you know, obviously the, the car is built in Vietnam right now, so it doesn't qualify for the new EV tax credit. Um, VinFast is building and opening a production facility in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So future products will be eligible for the tax credit, which is good. Do you think but, they'll be cheaper? By, just by nature being assembled here? I, I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, yeah, it's, really it's really difficult not. to imagine. I, I don't know. Like, I don't know the economies of manufacturing in Vietnam very well right now. I mean, I know that Vietnam was a place to do to offshore very cheap manufacturing decades ago. I'm not sure if that's still the case. And it certainly wasn't anything as complicated as an automobile. Right. But right. Um, let's let's move inside a little bit, too. Uh, so Steve Roper wrote, don't mind the look, but how does it operate? And he's talking about he said, Kyle Connor, uh, uh Friend of obviously great friend of Inside EV is host of one of the Inside EV podcasts. Drove a prototype. I think he was on the same program as you, Steve. And he said mm -hmm. it was he was very critical of the software, right? Yep. So obviously infotainment, like software in the cabin, uh, uh, driver facing is really important, especially for the EV segment right now. How, mm -hmm. How's it work? Like how's that come together? I mean, the so the system that it, that Vinfast has, it's um I believe it's a 15 inch central touch screen and okay. everything's in there. It's it's like Tesla in that way. Yeah. Everything is in the touch screen. There is no gauge cluster. There is a head up display, but you can't see it with polarized sunglasses. But yeah. so everything's in the gauge cluster. There are some things that are extremely difficult to find and use, but they're the kinds of things that you probably only are going to do once or twice, like adjusting the mirrors, adjusting the, the steering wheel. Um, adjusting the mirror is it like honestly took two of us five minutes to figure out how to do it just because it was so difficult. I think the issues with the software is just that um, it's really inconsistent in its performance. You know, swipes take way too long. If there's an icon for, you know, let's say Apple CarPlay or whatever, if you don't hit the exact middle of it and hit it really hard, it won't register. Uh, the menu structure is kind of all over the place. And a couple of times the system will just, it, at least with us, just crashed. Yeah. Um, so the software is is really, really, really still got to got to step up its game. Even the backup camera, the, the feed was choppy and laggy and like really, really, really low res. Just stuff that, you know, in a brand new car in 2023 is frankly unacceptable. Um, again, this can and be solvable to your point. I mean, you mentioned over the air updates, like it's, it can be addressable, but you know, Leonard just wrote it in the chat too. It sounds like they need to hire some more consultants to help get the tuning right there. Again, this, this feels like a product of a problem. That's a product of speed, speed to market more yep. than just not, uh, not knowing how to do something. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that they have the capability to do it. They certainly have the, the funding and the, um, mm -hmm. you know, the mindset to do it. Uh, but but moving a little bit too fast and putting putting the vehicle yeah. in the market, let alone in journalist hands when it's in this state, just seems like it's it's a miscalculation at this point. The driver assistance software is the same way. Really hit or miss. Um, I, I really am annoyed by the fact that whenever you tweak the settings to your liking, because someone will say, you know, oh, you can just turn all that stuff off. It's like, yeah, but then the minute you get out of the car, it automatically resets. So it doesn't remember your preferences. It doesn't do that stuff. It yeah, doesn't yeah. work consistently every single time um when we were using you know the the um level two system where it's uh adaptive cruise control and lane keeping assist it did work really well it was pretty smooth pretty easy but at no point did it ever tell me to put my hands back on the wheel and it would let me use it like in a busy city center um where it really shouldn't be operating uh, yeah but it like never asked me or my co-driver to put our hands on the wheel uh, conversely, there was another journalist I talked to on the program who said he was constantly getting notifications to put his hand on the wheel, but the system wasn't even on. Um, mm, also, uh, <laughs> there, there's that. But I mean, and it, the, the thing was also just, I would normally not harp on a car for constantly beeping at you, but the the, the most like alarming thing about it was before we left for the drive program, like some of the VinFast people actually said like, hey, just so you guys know, it's going to beep at you constantly. Don't worry. It's actually fine. That's, yeah. that's not a good look. Because um, they just, yeah. Yeah. A lot of this stuff just sounds like it is a really easy, you know, patch update away from solving mm -hmm. a lot of these problems at least. Completely um, agree. I think the there and getting everything, you know, that's great. Totally. And I, I really hope that a lot of this stuff can be fixed through over the air updates, because I think that, you know, on the surface, 
and you look at these things on paper, the VF8 has a lot to like about it. I mean, it looks pretty good. There's a lot of space inside. And again, the list of features that it offers is really long and competitive for a car that costs, you know, $57,000 in top spec. But then you get in and uh, I mean, one friend of mine, another journalist, uh, she got in the car and immediately the uh, seat levers broke. Um, the door panel gaps are terrible. The, the, the entire door card on the one show that the, I tested show the video. Would move. <laughs> yeah, it, like I took a video of it because it was so egregious. But just in the normal act of like pulling the door closed, um, the, <laughs> the entire thing just moves. Yeah. For those of you who maybe aren't watching, I, I, we, uh, you might be audio listeners to this too. What we're seeing is Steve sort of uh, gently tugging on the door handle like you would to shut it, <laughs> for instance, and seeing the entire door card flex. Like yeah, it's just not. They just didn't choose a thick enough gauge of plastic, no. right? There's or, all or sorts secret. of there's all sorts of good looking materials, and then you touch them and they feel bad. And a lot of the switch gear is just like unnecessarily cheap. Um, I do love that the Turn signal and wiper stocks are straight up late model BMW though. That was kind of nice. <laughs> what I didn't like was that the left turn signal in my car didn't work all the time. Which, yeah. That's uh, kind of like a, you know, that's that's sort of day one right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It just so, sounds like a lot of like, like a lot of teething issues that, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully uh like like uh I think it Leonard. Leonard said that mm -hmm. hire some consultants, rush a mid cycle facelift in a year or two, like Right. Completely. Hopefully, this could be a pretty competitive product once, once U.S. production starts. Mm -hmm. Once they get some of these kinks worked out, I, you know, I think, I think we're all rooting for it. I, I totally. everyone totally. that I talked to about this, like the idea of a of another automaker entering the industry and like and trying entering entering the U.S. market and competition always improves the breed. You know, if you can't cut it, you you die, and and if you mm -hmm. can cut it, then everyone else has to cut it too. So there's all it's always a good thing. But so none of us like want Vinfast to fail. Is is the abiding. There's, there's no amount of just like, oh, it's a new guy and we want it to suck. Everyone yeah. wants it to be good. And so I feel like it, it, it's, it's there. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, one really solid mid-cycle facelift away from being at least not a, not a mind-blowing decision. At least like, a, oh, right. okay, that was an interesting choice, you know? Like, Somebody asked the, uh, the, C the CEO of the company who was there, the North American CEO, um, who was very lovely, by the way. I absolutely loved getting to know her. But somebody asked her, you know, do you feel like you went too fast? You know, do you feel like you rushed it? And they say, no, like, we're really happy with the fact that we were able to bring this car to market so quickly. And I think that there is a pride point in that from the company standpoint. But the, the issue is just that, like, you know, the customers are going to see it and feel it every single day. And it'd yeah. be one thing if it was just, you know, the specific car that I drove had a couple of issues and, and, you know, they're going to get worked out, but it was, I mean, as more and more people would start coming back from the drive loops that we were doing, everyone was like, did yours do this thing? Or did yours do this thing? Or like, wow, that was really not not so great. So and, I agree with, and they I were, agree with they were but, job one cars, right? They were off the production line. They weren't pre-production testers yeah, or anything. Specifically asked, I said, is this representative of the final product that a customer can buy? And they said, this is final saleable spec. This was not a job one pre-pro anything mm -hmm. car. So this is, this is definitely on background. And just to be clear, like we don't do a lot of kind of like deep financial reporting at, at Inside EVs or Motor One, but like I was really, uh, my, my interest pricked up when I was reading a newsletter that a, a friend, a friend of, of ours kind of writes every, every week that talks about the business side of, you know, investing uh, VC and stuff like that. And he called out the fact that, and, and we may have had a story on this, that VinFast was going to go IPO. They were going to do an initial public offering, you know, go public, take the company public. And they kind of switched on a dime and made an announcement, I think just last week, maybe it was two weeks ago now, that they instead are doing a uh, merger SPAC with a company called Black Spade Acquisition. Don't know anything about the SPAC, don't know anything about that company. I do know that to make that kind of change at that late a date seems really unusual to me, who is not a financial expert. And again, in the words of the, the guy that I'm looking at or that wrote this said, this is the most surprising deal path I've seen in 18 months. So it's not, it's not something that was expected. And I only yeah. say that to say, 
this is, it feels like this whole company, this whole, like everything that we've, every touch point we've had as journalists with VinFast over the last 24 months, basically has been non-standard. They've been following a different way. And mm -hmm. maybe they are trying to do that sort of move fast and break stuff model. They probably are. We know that the US market is incredibly hungry for, for SUV, for EV SUVs, right? So mm -hmm. in a lot of ways you can see how it makes sense. But, but the whole planning process from, from how the money gets uh, handled all the way up through um, how the car drives on, on a twisty road seems like it hasn't really been dealt with fully, right? So yeah. for those of you, I just want to say that for those of you in the comments, and, and we said this already, who are sort of standing up for it and that, you know, like VinFast has a lot of potential. I think we all agree with you. It's just we're at a really interesting point right now. Um, and we need to see some the next time we do this, whether it's a VF9 or whether we are able to get into, you know, somebody brought up to me out, it would be intriguing to get to like purchase a VF8 as a long term car. Um, the next level of testing that we have on this, like sh there should be improvement. There should be some significant improvement. And if there's not, then we know there's a real problem. If there is, then we know it's, as you're saying, Brett, just kind of like big teething pain. So yeah, I really want to give Invest another shot when mm -hmm. they've made some improvements through the VF8 or if they say, you know, hey, we've kind of retuned some things for the, the next cars, the VF9, the three row SUV that's coming out uh, yeah. later this year. So I want them to learn from, you know, these initial things. Um, I'm, I'm sort of worried that maybe the criticism is not going to be taken to heart mm -hmm. um, only because there was a report that came out. I forget if it was today or yesterday where, you know, kind of in response to a lot of the negative reviews, the, the CEO just kind of called them noise um, <laughs> that, you know, they really shouldn't listen to. And I'm like, I really hope you do listen to it. And not, not in like a, you know, again, I have nothing against, Vinfast. I have nothing against the company. I would love for this company to succeed, but you gotta, you gotta make a good car. And like, look, building cars is is hard. Right. <laughs> I don't do it for that reason. But <laughs> you know, uh, there's just the benchmark for entry into the market at this point, especially at that price. You, you got to have something better. Yeah, absolutely. So. I, I encourage everybody to go back and read uh, Steve's review on Inside EVs. It's also on Motor One if you happen to be there. We've got it on both sites too. It's it's really well done. Uh, it's a great read and it's a super interesting car. And we hope to have um, a lot more VIN fast coverage in in the meantime. So uh, let's let's pivot quickly. I'll take a, a I've got a, a couple of less interesting things to talk about. We're gonna say Brett Brett has the uh, the the cherry on top of the Sunday this week for sure in terms of test cars, but. Um, so I, I'll handle this together. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Northern California for a uh, actually a really awesome week. I got to I was able to go and, and uh, experience Skip Barber's Racing School, their three day GT racing school, which is really incredible. For those of you who don't know, I mean, Skip Barber has been around for a really, really long time. Um, they are actually under new management over the last, I think, uh, just just a few years, less than five years, maybe. Um, and I've really I, I think righted the ship uh, at a program that was already already doing something really well. So the the three day school was me going out, um, basically splitting time between classroom and track and driving race prepped uh, two generation old Mustang GTs, uh, Mustang GT race cars, really learning a lot about car control. Um, we were out at uh, I was I still want to say uh, it's Sonoma Raceway, but I still want to say Sears Point because I'm old. Um, which is, a, which is a super fun track. Um, and, and honestly it was great because it wasn't just about like driving a car on a racetrack. I've done that a lot, like over the course of my career, I've been lucky to be in a lot of fast cars, much faster than ones, who, even the race cars we were driving on racetracks, but I'd never had like this kind of formal experience learning the, the kind of the, the nuts and bolts, uh, and really breaking it down, like really understanding, um, you know, how to approach every single corner, um, how to have a strategy for it, how to think through it analytically, and then be able to practice that over and over again when you're, uh, when you're out there on the track. Right. So, um, just, just can't recommend the, the program highly enough. We're, I'm going to write a feature about it too. It's going to be on motor one. So you guys will be able to check that out, but, um, yeah, to, to start with though, just as, as like a car nerd, because I know that you guys have both been in, um, you know, certainly like your fair share of Mustangs and, and Kyle, hopefully you got the folder because I do have some, some pictures from the track, but these things were both awesome, but also like 
they were you can tell that these are these are school cars right like this is not somebody's garage queen somebody's uh you know they take it out every a couple times a year or something like that to attract these are cars that are like working race cars uh good tires really good brakes um but you know and and some five speed some six speed uh manual transmission everything is just freaking bulletproof on these things though and um and it's one of the first things that you notice is like this is the most v8 sounding v8 i've ever heard in my life because you've got <laughs> you've got a super free breathing uh unrestricted yeah. exhaust um you hear every tiny rock that that rattles up against the bottom of the of the frame as you're going and there are a lot of them and the car is set up not to be the you know the the fastest you can make a gt because obviously they they've got people of all skill levels doing this program and, and driving the car what they're doing is making the car give as much feedback as possible so that you can really understand what what is happening um you know basically with your with your levels of grip um uh so the steering is really although it's you know how long has it been since you guys drove a 20 year old Mustang, right? Like it's not, it, it is not the tightest, quickest rack in the world. Um, but there is, you just get like just acres and acres of feedback from it. Um, and you feel everything again through the, through the chassis too. So, uh, the cars themselves are really, really fun. Um, and, and, uh, just like surprisingly approachable, like I said, for, we had, we had a, a group of people out there. Some people had never been in any kind of race car before, um, and others, others of us had a lot of experience. There's some people there who were racing all the time who were really, really quick, um, right off the bat. And they still wanted to go and sort of hone their craft and, and learn a little bit more, both about the track and about their own kind of skill set. So, um, just, Did they have the, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. You're good. Did they have the, uh, like the standard Ford live axle on the back. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They hadn't, but they did, uh, I've, I've got it in my notes. Like they basically did, um, a little bit of bracing uh in the in the uh -huh. front end of the car um obviously they've got non-stock wheels and tires on it sure. um they've got willwood brakes i think most of the cars had willwood brakes um with with great big discs um and and you know like race compound uh brake pads sure. and things like that um the cabins are stripped so you're in racing buckets they do have a passenger seat um which makes a lot of sense for like the school thing but other than that they're not that far from stock if they tuned it beyond just putting a different exhaust on it. I, I'm not exactly sure. They didn't do anything significant at all. So like, I mean, you yeah. like, I would have to go back. I think this is a car that was making 305 or 315 horsepower or something like that out of the factory when it was new. Um, I think it was 300 even, uh, 300, but I've yeah. heard that about, I've heard that about that car that it is like, apart from kind of being a little bumpy and, and hairy when you're, you know, hitting mid corner bumps, I've heard that the live axle, what is that? The S five fifty Mustang. Is that what? No, the S. Oh, nah, man. I'm so bad with the internal I codes. Know. I know me too. If it's Whatever not an S95, though, I, don't I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that that is like a really progressive platform. Like it's a really good platform for learning how to drive quickly because it doesn't bite you ever. It just kind of lets you know what's going on, which um, you know, kind of kind of cool for an old live axle Mustang to be such a good like learning car. I actually yeah. remember that generation Mustang with the V8, especially being a great like learning how to drive a manual car too, just because it was like really accessible, good torque, a decent gearbox, good clutch, just everything about it felt super solid, and it felt like a great you know learner's car. Yeah, it's not, it's, it really is. It feels, it feels pretty unburstable. Like I'm not, I was practicing on that. We, you do a whole module on heel towing. Um, you know, I don't know how, actually one of the things that is still kind of an open question for me is how much longer they're going to be able to run a program like this. Not because people like, I, I think people are obviously still interested in driving manual transmission cars, but even racing like on the grassroots level is moving more and more to two pedal cars as opposed to three pedal cars. Right. So we had a kid, you know, and I, I say that not uh, as a pejorative, like an actual kid, I think he might've been 19 or 20 years old who was on the program who, um, who, had he he raced all the time he, he had a he had a mustang race car a newer one is an automatic right it was the first thing he's talking about with all this kind of nervous energy because he was very he knew how to drive a manual transmission car but he was very unused to it but to your point steve yeah it's it's um there's a long clutch on it and a short throw shifter and um but it's very forgiving in terms of like take a point and things like that you can you don't have to heel toe when you're downshifting. Honestly, with this car, it's not going to break, and it's very forgiving of that. It, you're you're a lot quicker um, if you if you are able to. But 
it really is a good platform for you honing your skills as opposed to being worried about whether or not the car is going to do something or not do something. Yeah. Um, we had a couple of people spin. I came, I came close to spinning one time on one of the last sessions of the, the last day when you were really moving a lot, a lot more quickly, right? Like you're, you absolutely knew the track. You could close your eyes and see what was coming around the next corner. You know where to put the car and you're starting to push a little bit. Um, and so I got a little loose at, at one point, but not anything that was dangerous. And then I think that there were maybe two or three spins the entire three day program with just like tons and tons of lapping of the car. So no, no big offs, no huge problems. So I think that that speaks to both the education that you're getting, the seriousness, seriousness with which people are approaching it and also the car being pretty forgiving. So, and, and pretty sticky. Yeah. Um, Sounds cool. uh, yeah. Uh, so we've got Aussie uh, to you saying, glad to hear Skip Barber came out of bankruptcy, uh, did their program in the 90s in Vipers. That would have been <laughs> that, that, that would, would have been, not been a forgiving experience. Not at all. No, a lot, a lot different. Um, yeah, they I, I know that there are a couple of older guys who had done some Skip Barber three days a few years ago when they were still running Miatas. And again, it was the old ownership. Um, uh, the, the bankruptcy thing, I know this has got to be incredibly difficult business. Listen, you've got to own like dozens, if not hundreds of, of vehicles and maintain them. You've got to carry crazy insurance. You have to have really strong, um, instructors and keep them around. Nobody, my understanding is nobody's making a lot of money doing this. They're usually, there, there are so many guys who are there who are, who are trying to become race car drivers. And again, they're in their like early twenties, um, and they just love doing it, but it's, it's, uh, it's an enterprise run by passion and making it, um, uh, you know, paying the bills every month has got to be really difficult. So, um, yeah, no, super fun time. And then just, just to hit it quickly, it, I was lucky to get a Mercedes AMG to loan me an E53 while I was out there. So I stayed about a half an hour away from the track. So Sonoma raceway is in a pretty small town. So it's, it's hard to get a hotel there. And I had, um, I didn't drive it a ton because I was basically exhausted by the end of the day too, but I had this really beautiful blue, uh, E 53 cab, um, super quick, especially when you're driving a big naturally aspirated, uh, uh, V eight all the time. This, uh, what is it? Is it twin turbocharged? I can't remember. It's a, uh, uh, Sing single turbo straight six, Yeah, single turbo straight with, six. Um, like the best electric turbocharger you'll ever Absolutely so amazing. Just, just instant power. Like as soon as you touch the, as you touch the throttle and you do have the thing, I know that you guys have had this before where you're like, I just got off a racetrack and now I'm getting into a fast road car on a, on a, on a regular road. And you sort of forget the rules and the fact that there are police around and things like that too. So, um, but yeah, it was That's super probably fun. my favorite powertrain, uh, like maybe currently on the market, that might be my favorite balance of like smoothness, power, torque, fun to drive, um, but not being like overbearing. I love that inline six in everything I drive it in. Yeah, that's that's the thing I was going to echo too, is that it's great in every application. Like I'm uh, I'm going to Arizona this weekend to visit some friends and I have a GLE 53 with that same powertrain, but it's in a, you know, two or SUV. And I'm like, I know it's going to be good. Yeah, I had an E450 Cabrio last year. And it was blue with a white, like ivory and blue, navy blue interior. And I just felt like the king of Palm Springs driving around in that car. It was just like <laughs> big and stylish. And I wanted to take my friends everywhere in it because I felt so cool and not like sporty in the slightest, but just like, oh, I loved it. Yeah, I thought like and I think I think AMG is amazing. It has been amazing at this for a long time. And the current generation is great. But like the car is so variable, too. I mean, it can be really laid back and just be super quick. But like the ride quality is is nice. Um, uh, the I'm too tall for it to work properly, but I've always been a giant fan of of the way that Mercedes manages airflow and its convertibles too. the spillover of the of the air on the windscreen. If you're a normal sized person is is totally doable. And even for me, you know, it was cold uh, Northern California mornings uh, when I'm when I'm driving out there with the top down. But not I wasn't I wasn't, you know, freezing my my ass off getting out there either. Just a little bit of the top of my head, too. So I mean, also air scarf. The single Airscarf. greatest thing ever created. So amazing. And they've gotten rid of the, so air scarf, for those of you who don't know, is the, is the sort of heated air that blows at the back of your neck out of the seat rest, um, which is just so pleasant when it's cold out and you've got the top down. And in the old car, I, 
Steve, we probably worked together at the time. Maybe the first time I drove a car with it, it was an SLK, an AMG. Mm -hmm. What was that one? The first AMG SLK. Um, like SLK 55 or? Yeah, probably 55. I remember if you leaned back on it, it would go, wow. <laughs> like that you'd be like <laughs> pressing on the fan motor or something and mm -hmm. it would cause it to rev. Uh, or maybe the fan was hitting something. It was just making a really bad noise. So they've eliminated <laughs> a lot of that, uh, some yeah. of the, the weirdness. But yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, just a, just like such a beautiful blend of performance and uh, luxury in this version of the car and a really nice way to, you know, again, after I realized there are cops on the road, decompress from a stressful day of being in classes and, and, uh, and, and race cars. So, um, but speaking of race cars <laughs> uh, and maybe not decompressing based on your, your track experience, Brett Evans, you had a you had a spe special week in Palm Springs this last week, two weeks ago. Yeah, it was. I don't even remember. It's been yeah, such a blur. But yeah, no, it was the exact opposite of decompressing. It was so freaking intense of an experience. It was so <laughs> this good. This is crazy looking, by the way. Uh, and I I actually don't love the way that it looks. I'm I'm gonna get the negatives out of the way right now. I hate the exposed rivets on the um on the fenders. This is like, it's straight out of the JC Whitney catalog for a pre-owned Dodge Ram. I don't like it at all on the Lamborghini. First, first tell people what we're driving, what you're looking at in case they're listening and not watching. Because I think everybody right, watching sorry. knows that this is a Lamborghini. But so I want you to know that the vehicle that I'm driving that has bolt-on fender flares from the JC Whitney catalog for a Dodge Ram was the Lamborghini um, Huracan Storado. Uh, <laughs> and it like, it's so, it. Apart from that, that's my only complaint. And maybe the interior is a little cramped, but I'm a tall guy and I understand that this is a supercar and that's just what you do when you drive a supercar. The, Look at those roof this, rails. It's so <laughs> stupid and so awesome. And so they, they were like showing us like pictures of this car with the roof rails where it had, um, it had uh, racks on it. And the rack is designed that that, that hood scoop like still takes in air even if you have your snowboard or your surfboard or whatever on the roof it's just like it's so silly it's such a silly car big old v naturally aspirated 5.2 liter v10 it's the least powerful v10 in the huracan family at like 602 horsepower i think but 602 horsepower is still nothing to sneeze at zero to 16 yeah. 3.5 on road it was an absolute honey it's got 1.7 more inches of ground clearance than the regular huracan so like you could take driveways and speed bumps and normal everyday traffic with no trouble whatsoever but just like oh man this thing was a blast describe so, to me in a couple of sentences because obviously we're gonna if we have it already we're gonna link to your review and encourage people to go drive or uh, read your first drive review of this car but like how does lamborghini describe what this car is to you like what is the pitch what is the elevator pitch for huracan Storado? so lamborghini calls the huracan a super sports car and that's just their, you know, their parlance. It's the super sports car, um, the entry level super sports car, and then the um, Aventador and uh, Revuelto are the flagship super sports car. So this thing, um, yeah, there's some of the footage on the track. Oh, that was so cool. Um, so this thing is um, started as just like a doodle, kind of a skunk works doodle, where um, Lamborghini came out with the Urus, and the idea behind the Urus was that it was an everyday supercar. You could use it, you know, with with luggage and family and it had some off-road capability. They've got a spec racing series of off-road, um, off-road Urus vehicles. Um, and so they kind of were like hoping that Lamborghiniites would kind of adopt the Urus as like a, as a rough road vehicle. And that didn't really happen. Um, and so one day the um, head of design um, was just kind of doodling and, and kind of was like, what would happen if you did an Urus sized super sports car and he doodled a huracan with big tires and uh and a roof rack and and off-road lights and that was that was it was just literally like a back of the napkin doodle and people kind of like the 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 timing between this and the dakar is the 911 dakar is purely coincidental like so bizarre like some people were, oh lamborghini must have gotten wind that porsche was doing an off-roader or vice versa porsche must have gotten wind that lamborghini was doing an off-road sports car let's let's do it and um that was purely coincidental. They were both developed almost completely independently. They both debuted at about the same time with similar specs and, uh, you know, only about a $70,000 price difference, which at this echelon is a rounding error. Um, so yeah, it was just, it's just like hilarious how, um, how they, how they built this thing, just kind of like a, like a 
12th grade doodle, just some guy wanting to make a wacky oddball off-road supercar. Um, and it, I mean, it works is the thing. Like they, um, they took us out to, um, Oh, I'm blanking on the raceway now. Chuck, Chuck Walla. Walla. Chuck Walla Raceway. Took us out to Chuck Walla. They had um, plowed a, like, half the track. It was a two-mile track, and half of it was on, on pavement. And then the other half, they literally plowed a course through the inner, like, the, in, the infield of Chuck Walla and had us just pounding around on, on dirt um, for, you know, half of this two-mile circuit. And we had a, we had a Lamborghini professional co-driver, um, telling us what to do and kind of like advising us on how to drive rally style instead of driving like a like a supercar. And so um, their advice was literally just put your foot all the way down on the floor and and give it all the gas it's got and the car will work out what it needs to do to get you moving forward. And then you just have to point and steer. And that was roughly how it worked. Like it was just absolutely yeah. bonkers. Um, and it was a really that sounds like a video game experience. It was really involving. It was really cool. But it wasn't. Um, it wasn't like a unapproachable vehicle to drive to my absolute surprise. It was like, so you could just, you could just pound it anywhere you wanted to. The best part was as the day went on, this infield got like carved out and, and etched and, you know, lots of ruts and, and um, kind of like nasty terrain that they didn't intend to have happen. And the co-driver was just like, no, nope, don't worry about it. Even if you hear it, like hitting its bump stops, even if you hit the underside of the car, hitting the dirt, just keep going. The car can take it. And so you kind of had to just like hang all of your like mechanical sympathy and self-preservation out the window and just like, just do it. It was so fun. It was such a good experience. Um, and the, the, my favorite part about this car was um, Chuck Walla has a really, really wide final corner with a really late apex. And I am not I have not done Skip Barber. I don't know how to I know, I know how to drive decently. I'm like fairly confident that I know how to keep a car on the shiny side up. But I'm terrible when it comes to late apexes. So I always, always clip the apex really early. And, um, and so I always messed up the corner and lost all of my time. They were timing us too. And I was always like pretty close to the back You're of the timing track. timing you too? Of, That's like they never, ever die no. time journalist on the track. <laughs> well, and they didn't tell us who was winning. All I know is that I shared a car with Kurt Niebuhr. And so Kurt's telemetry was in the screen alongside mine and so if i like dared take my eyes off of the off of the track for a minute i could kind of catch and see how kurt and i were tracking um and i was pretty much neck and neck with him until this last corner when i always hit the apex too early but as a result i just like dialed in tons and tons of opposite lock and floored it and these all-terrain tires that are specially built for the Dorado by bridgestone just like let you slide this lurid massive like eminently controllable power slide all the way through the corner and it was just like it was i mean it was just like a very i can't i'm not going to say that it was like talent or skill at all it was 100 percent the car helping keep me you know going the way i wanted to go but it was so flattering and so cool my co-driver was like you keep messing up that corner but i still think you're the king because you keep drifting it like that and i was like yeah that feels good i appreciate it and then you know of course he's flattering my ego but still it was just such a cool experience man that's awesome. So, so Leonard is back to say, so it's like the cyber truck and I'll just leave that there for one of you guys to, you can, you can just knock that out of the park if you want. Um, we you got one feet up. Haven't Steven? driven the cyber truck. I mean, I was going to say it's, it's unlike the cyber truck in that it exists. Uh, so that's neat. <laughs> I mean, it's listen, unlike I, the cyber truck in that we've driven it and we've pounded on it and it hasn't broken. We, it's we, still a wedge, so we, we know something about it. Yeah, probably in spirit. You know, fast forward uh, down the road again. Like mm -hmm. the, I, maybe maybe the relevant point here is like whether whether the 911 Dakar was developed <laughs> first or this was developed first uh, in terms of being drawn like a child. That's perfect. Money. You know what? I I gotta <laughs> just quickly <laughs> comment on that and say the. I drove the 911 Dakar earlier this year and yeah. spent a lot of time with it in the dirt and everything and. The one thing that I actually kind of wished that car did was like go slightly more over the top in some sure. ways. I don't think it needs, you know, the the JC Whitney bolt on fender flares, but I think it's just it's a little too conservative, even with all like the cool race livery packages you can get on it. Like I just kind of wanted there to be like weird lights or like a, yeah. you know, standard roof rack or just something else that kind of made it like a little bit wilder um 
but knowing Porsche, that's probably coming. So yeah, I mean, Strato is so great because it's like whether you want to drive it or not. And by the way, how much does this thing cost? How many are they making? Like ten of them? They're making fourteen ninety nine. They've all been sold. They yeah. started at about two hundred and seventy nine thousand dollars with uh, with destination. Okay, so I mean. You're not gonna. It's not like you're gonna see a ton of them. That's that's way more than I thought. I actually thought it was three digits of this car. So so that's pretty good. But like you know, it's got those like pod lights on the front for driving lights and the and the weird scoops and like you said, the roof rails. It's just so much fun, right? Mm -hmm. I think that the Dakar, the 911 Dakar, is incredibly fun too. And the point I was making with Cybertruck is like what we've learned. We've seen this now with a lot of like the sort of bro dozer off road trucks too. Like people like the idea of being able to go fast and go off road. Does it make a ton of sense? Absolutely not. Is it something mm -hmm. that, that people who like driving want to do every once in a while? For sure. Right. So if you're a billionaire and you want to have a fun Lamborghini that can go off road, why not? Uh, why not this? <laughs> why not both? Frankly? Yeah. Um, uh, hilarious. That is, that is absolutely incredible. I'm so jealous. I'm always jealous of cars. Maybe this will, probably not with a VF8, but I'm always jealous of cars that I know somebody else drove and I will never, ever, ever have a chance to drive. And I'm sure this falls into that camp, but, uh, well, hold, hold your tongue a little bit because they did say that they are putting a couple of them into the media fleet. So hopefully, ooh. you know, someone in this room will get a chance at one sooner or later. Um, because yeah, no, it is. It, and I had that same thought as I was driving away, I left Palm Springs the next morning. They gave me like a little one forty third scale version of the car that I drove, which was really like lovely, very, like very nice parting gift. Yeah. Um, and I just like was looking at it. I got in my car, I sat down, I looked at it. I was like, I'm never going to drive one of these ever again. This was it. And, and like, it made me really it, like kind of made me sad for probably the first 30 minutes of my drive. Just kind of like, well, Glad I got to do it, but I wish I could do it every single day. It was it was great. So Matt, it's probably not going to happen. But Steve, you know, you're a former Detroit kid. Like, how much fun would that car be in, in driving through Detroit for a week? I mean, you would be in the winter. In the week, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You would be you would be a superstar wherever you went, right? Yeah. Like, well, and I think it has I think it has tow points too, so you could like pull people out <laughs> who are not prepared. Yeah, I love no, it. No, I would like go. Get, I would go get those full... roses out. I would go full blizzard, you know, Christmas morning, <laughs> Huracan Storado. Oh, yeah, for sure. I like this. This is shaping up into a, into a great pitch. We'll work on this and, and see what we can get together. But um, all right, guys, this has been really, really fun. Thank you, everybody, for all the comments. Thanks for all the conversation about VinFast. Again, like I know that I've, we got some um, uh, oppositional. We had a, a comment about don't try to convince don't try to convince us about the VinFast. Um, we don't really understand the how to sorry, they need more time to figure out advanced operate features. I'm not calling that out uh, specifically. I'm just saying, um, we, I think we've tried to express this. Like we're, we're willing to, to have another experience with VinFast and the VF8 and really hope that it goes great. But in the meantime, appreciate the conversation there. Um, Brett, thanks for joining us yet again. Steve, really appreciate you taking some of your valuable time to come in and give us yet another lowdown on VF8. And we'd love to have you back another time. Um, Always good to be here. Go read, go read Steve's review right away. Cause even if you are a VinFast fanboy, it's a, his, there's some hysterical turns of phrase. So really, really go good read Steve's review right away. Absolutely. Um, for those of you who maybe are catching this after the fact, as I uh, love to say, please leave us a comment on YouTube. We'll go through and try and answer those if we missed your question or your comment here. And um, please do, you can download this podcast if you're more into uh, audio streaming or if you're not able to, to join us live on a Thursday, um, you can download it and listen to it on all your favorite audio streaming platforms. I think I'm supposed to ask you to rate us and review us and that'd be great. Uh, <laughs> beyond that, you know, do, do what your heart intends. Um, all right. Thanks, guys. See you next Thursday. Have a good one.